Will and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on WBCA LP 102.9 FM Boston, Boston Free Radio, uh, in addition to that. You are also watching me on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station out there that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page, or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And I have five new movies to review for you for this show, but first I'm going to start off with What's Topping the Box Office, the rundown of the top ten highest-grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits. Some of them are flops, but I'll let you know the difference as we progress. So the number one movie at the box office this weekend is a movie I kind of expected to take the number one spot, but then again, this list can be somewhat unpredictable at times, unless it's a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, or even a Marvel Comics movie that doesn't necessarily have to be in the MCU. But in this case, the number one movie this week was Crazy Rich Asians, starring Constance Wu, which took in $26.5 million this weekend, and because it opened on a Wednesday uh, last week, Its total gross so far in the United States is $35.3 million. Around the world, it has grossed $39.6 million, and that is against a budget of $30 million, which makes it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, and it could be a certified hit by next week, if not next week, probably two weeks from now. But of course, we'll have to see. The Meg was number one at the box office last week. This week, in its second week in release, it's number two, having grossed $21.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from $130 to $178 million, the Meg has so far grossed $83.8 million here in the States and $316 million worldwide. So it's doing incredibly well worldwide. But here in the States, it's not a hit yet. Around the world, I guess it could be considered a tentative hit, but that, of course, depends on how much it actually costs to make, which I don't know the exact number. I only know the range, or at least the approximation. Mile 22 was the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number three at the box office, having grossed $13.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. And I don't have the international numbers for how much it grossed, but I can tell you that Mile 22 cost approximately 35 to $50 million to make, which means it's not even close to a hit, even in the low range. And it's not looking good for Mile 22, but it could recover. It, it just could. Mission Impossible Fallout was number two at the box office last week. This week is number four, having grossed $10.8 million at the U.S. box office this weekend in its fourth week in release. Against a budget of $178 million, Mission Impossible Fallout has so far grossed $181 million this past, excuse me, total in the United States and a staggering $501.9 million worldwide. So it is a tentative hit here in the States. It may not be a certified it, but then again, it could still be making money into September, and it could make twice as much as it costs to make here in the States, but around the world, it is most certainly a certified hit, and showing that last year's The Mummy was just a rare misstep for Tom Cruise, and he is actually recovering quite nicely with a familiar franchise. Alpha is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number five at the box office having made $10.4 million at the U.S. box office this weekend, a total of $11.7 million around the world, which means that in every other country besides the United States, Alpha has only made $1.3 million. But that is against a budget of $51 million. So again, like Mile 22, Alpha is not off to the greatest start, but it could recover. Of course, we'll have to see. 
Christopher Robin, the Disney movie, is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding from number seven. La- excuse me, sliding from number three last week, having grossed eight point nine million dollars at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of seventy five million dollars, Disney's Christopher Robin has so far grossed sixty six point nine million dollars here in the states and ninety million dollars worldwide, which means it's not a hit yet here in the states, but it's very close. But around the world, it is a tentative hit so far. Will it be a certified hit? It's kind of unlikely at this point, but it could pull through. Black Klansman is number seven of the box office this weekend, sliding from number five last week, having grossed $7.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of 15, that's $1.5 million, Black Klansman is so far in its two weeks of release has grossed $23.4 million here in the States and $25.6 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, and it could actually be a certified hit by next week. And while I try not to play favorites, I love the movie Black Klansman. I think it's one of the best movies of the year so far, and I would hate to see this movie just settle for being a tentative hit. Hopefully it will be certified, especially given its modest budget, by next week. But of course, as always, we'll have to see. Slender Man is a movie I hated, but in it but besides that, it took actually probably the biggest slide this week, sliding from number four last week when it debuted to number eight this week, having grossed four point eight million dollars at the US box office this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from t- 10 to 28 million dollars. Slender Man has so far grossed 20.6 million dollars here in the States and 22.2 million dollars worldwide, which means if it cost as little as 10 million dollars to make, it could be a certified hit, but my guess is it's probably a tentative hit here in the States. But of course, we'll have to see later on when the actual budget is revealed. Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation was number 9 at the box office last week. This week, it's also surprisingly number 9. I would have thought, given that the summer is winding down, the thought of a movie whose subtitle is Summer Vacation would also wane in popularity, but apparently that's not the case, because Hotel Transylvania 3 grossed $3.8 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $80 million, Hotel Transylvania 3 has so far grossed $154 million here in the States and $426.1 million million dollars worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit worldwide. And finally, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again is number 10 at the box office this weekend, having grossed $3.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $75 million, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again has so far grossed $111.2 million here in the States total and $319.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, certified hit worldwide. Imagine if I told you that an earthquake was going to hit tomorrow right where you live. That it would be 6.5 in magnitude with aftershocks occurring twice 25 minutes apart. You'd no doubt talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true. I can't tell you an earthquake will happen tomorrow. But what if it does? Shouldn't you have a plan? Visit lacounty.gov slash emergency and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Ad Council. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is Crazy Rich Asians. This is the latest from director John M. Chu, who is an American actor of Asian descent. And a lot of his previous films in which he has directed haven't especially been, shall we say, auspicious. He's directed actually two of the Step Up movies, Step Up to the Streets and Step Up 3D. He's directed G.I. Joe Retaliation with star Dwayne Johnson. He actually directed Justin Bieber's concert film Never Say Never. And the other film he directed before 
Crazy Rich Asians was Now You See Me Too, which I remember seeing. It wasn't particularly memorable, but Crazy Rich Asians is a big step up for for John M. Chu, and I mean that in the least patronizing way. Of course, you got to start somewhere, especially in Hollywood. So Crazy Rich Asians is actually based on a 2013 novel of the same name by Kevin Kwan, and the film stars Constance Wu in her first big screen lead role and Constance Wu has been in a number of uh, TV shows and a, a few movies over the last couple of years she's probably best known for playing the matriarch of the family in uh, the Huang family in the ABC comedy series Fresh Off the Boat and I haven't seen I, I don't watch a lot of TV I've seen a couple of episodes of Fresh Off the Boat so I'm kind of familiar with the premise of the show but I can tell you that every time I've seen it I thought Constance Wu was hilarious in that show as are many of the other cast members but this is the first time a lot of audiences who don't get to watch a lot of tv like myself actually get to be, see her on the big screen and i i have to say it is a very impressive lead actor or actress in this case debut from her so the movie is about a young asian american woman who was born to chinese parents but despite having Chinese heritage and also being fluent in English and Chinese, she has actually never been to Asia at all. And that changes when she develops a romantic relationship with a man from Singapore whose name is Nick Young, and her, his last name is actually spelled Y-O-U-N-G, not, as you'd imagine, somebody from Singapore would spell their last name Y-U-N-G, but apparently his last name is Young, and he's played by a very charming actor who I'd never heard of before by the name of Henry Golding. And he, very much like Constance Wu, has a very promising career after this movie, uh, considering how good they were in this film. I mean, not only did they, ha they have amazing chemistry, but they also acted really well. And eventually... Constance, Wu, Constance Wu's character, whose name is Rachel Chu, is invited by her boyfriend Nick to Singapore to meet his family as one of his relatives is actually getting married. And again, despite the fact that Rachel Chu does have Chinese descent, like Nick Young's family, she finds that she is not fitting in particularly well with her family and with his family, excuse me, and is especially trying to win the good graces of Nick Young's mother, Eleanor, who's played by the great Michelle Yeoh. And Michelle Yeoh, for those of you who are not familiar with her, she's a Malaysian actress whose roles are best known in movies like the 007 movie Tomorrow Never Dies from 1997, where she co-starred alongside Pierce Brosnan. And she's probably best known for her role in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Again, that's amongst... Western audiences, that is, audiences in the U.S. and Canada who are not of Asian descent. <laughs> and I would probably be included in that category. So there are a lot of really good characters here. As a matter of fact, if, if I was to compare this to another movie, it would probably be Monsoon Wedding, which came out in 2001 or 2002. That was also, as the title suggests, revolving around a wedding and also another couple who's not getting married but uh, certainly having uh, relationship difficulties as a result of the stress that's put upon them by their family coming together and that sort of claustrophobia that comes with planning a wedding and also executing the as perfect a wedding as you could possibly make it so by far, the inter the most interesting plot in this movie involved Rachel Chu, Constance Wu's character, and her trying to warm up to Nick Young, her boyfriend's family, which is very hard to do with Nick's mother, but is easier to do with other characters in Nick Young's family, such as his grandmother, Ma, who's played by Lisa Liu, who is 
uh, a character actress I'm sure Western audiences aren't familiar with either. There are also some very amusing supporting performances, probably most notably by the... Uh, rapper and YouTube star Aquafina, who is best known for having been in this um, this summer's Ocean's Eight as probably the least well known of the women who are starring in this film. But again, Aquafina had not only has <laughs> a very <laughs> memorable stage name, but she also was really funny in that that movie Ocean's Eight, and she's also really funny in this one as well. Also, Ken Jeong from TV shows like Community and movies like Knocked Up is also in this movie as well. He plays a guy named Wai Mun Go, who is a relative of Aquafina's character, Peekling Go. And at, at first, he has somewhat of a, an offensive Chinese accent before saying, no, nah, I'm just kidding, I was born in the United States. That part rubbed me the wrong way a little bit, but maybe I, I shouldn't be offended considering I'm not of Asian descent at all. But in addition to a lot of the really good performances in this movie, this is also a film where Singapore, which is an independent city-state, looks beautiful. In fact, I would not be surprised if, <clears throat> because of this movie, tourism to Singapore, especially from the United States and Canada, goes way up because this movie makes Singapore look amazing, almost like another character. And Crazy Rich Asians gets my rating of a knockout. It is a superb romantic comedy. And also, Constance Wu has a career-making performance Hello, in this Hello, it's me, the designer jeans in the back of your closet. What happened to us? I I used to summer in the Hamptons, and now I'm stuck behind a pair of sweats. Okay, maybe I never really fit you right, but I got a lot more Sunday fun days left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I can really make a difference. Your donations to Goodwill create jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to Goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come, Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses. Hey. Social events. What? And the Black Experience. Okay. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Mile 22, which is the latest from director Peter Berg, who is collaborating with Mark Wahlberg for the fourth time in five years. The first film they did together that I can see is... Lone Survival, which I thought was pretty good. Deepwater Horizon, which wasn't quite as good. Patriot's Day was a little bit of a disappointment. And it seems like the trajectory between the collaboration of director Peter Berg and his star Mark Wahlberg is kind of going down. Because Mile 22, even though it has some impressive action scenes here and there and some potentially good characters, is just a mess of a film. It has so much high-octane action that director Peter Berg, who who didn't write the movie but still directed and produced it forgot one essential thing to make this movie worthwhile and that is a story there's a story in there somewhere but it's muddled by flying bullets so i'll try to describe to you the plot of this movie as best i can um an elite american intelligence officer who I assume is Mark Wahlberg's character, aided by a top-secret tactical command unit, again, the, the name is, is lost in the shuffle here, tries to smuggle a mysterious police officer with sensitive information out of the country. And this film goes by so fast. As a matter of fact, there is exposition behind Mark Wahlberg's character. He plays a guy who's very high-strung, very similar to the Boston police officer he played in The Departed, but the only difference is there's not enough time to develop his character. In fact, you can tell this movie is in such a rush when... Mark Wahlberg's character's exposition is crammed right into the opening credits. As a matter of fact, you know that 
he had some situation when he was a kid where he was high strung and maybe he wasn't really paying attention a lot in class and he had anger management problems. And one of the key characteristics of Mark Wahlberg's character in this film is he at all times has a rubber band around his left wrist. And whenever he gets agitated, he snaps the rubber band against his wrist. Now that is something that's very memorable to, to see in Mark Wahlberg's character. And that that's pretty unique. As a matter of fact, as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, what happens if the rubber band breaks? What if he can't find a rubber band? What happens to him? Does he turn into Mr. Hyde, figuratively speaking? Well, the movie doesn't really elaborate upon what could happen to Mark Wahlberg's character if he loses a rubber band or if the rubber band breaks like rubber bands tend to do. It And... As the movie progressed, I began to forget the reason why he had the rubber band. And I still can't really elaborate it to you guys because it went by so fast that I couldn't really keep track of it. There's another interesting character in this film who's another agent in this unidentified uh, tactical command unit whose name is Alice Kerr, and she's played by Lauren Cohen, best known for playing Maggie in The Walking Dead. And I've, I love Lauren Cohen ever since I, I've seen her in The Walking Dead. And she was in another movie called The Boy, which was a horror film that was released last year. It was okay, but she was really good in that film. And I thought she was really good in this movie, too. But unfortunately... Th- th- to this movie's credit, the, the film does elaborate upon how she is struggling in her personal life because of her uh, career with this elite unit. She is divorced, and she has a daughter who's birthday she can't make it to because of her demanding schedule i thought that's a good story arc as well we have seen it before but i thought lauren cohen delivered that believably but again probably less so than other characters her exposition is still noticeably rushed there's also another agent named sam snow who's played by ronda rousey making her acting debut in a film where she's not playing herself and i actually thought that ronda rousey acted pretty well with what she was given but again there's no story behind her and there's also an agent m like character in this film named bishop who's played by john malkovich who is advising these command units as they're trying to get this military police officer named Lee Knorr, who's played by Eco Uwais, to safety, and they have to travel 22 miles to get him out of the country where, where he has sensitive information, and he also has a, a bomb that he, he is needing to deactivate, and he's relying on this this intelligence tactical top secret command unit to defuse such a bomb so there is too much going on here as a matter of fact when when eco uasis character was introduced i thought okay is this guy a villain or a hero what is he doing at this embassy what is going to be accomplished when this tactical unit is bringing him to safety i just didn't know and the reason for that is as i said earlier and hopefully you guys tuning in aren't hearing me repeat myself there are all bullets all explosions and a very muddled story with characters that get completely lost in the shuffle and it's really too bad because i did think mark Wahlberg acted pretty well in this film i loved lauren cohen in this movie and eco uwais actually had a pretty good breakthrough performance here but again it's just way too much going on this movie focused on high octane and explosives and action and it didn't focus on story and one of the thing one of my main criticisms about Peter Berg's pre- previous directorial effort, Patriots Day, was that movie also seemed to be rushed, but not just because I lived the events of the Boston Marathon bombing, but it just seemed like he focused more on the action, and he also had the characters 
almost seem like they were they were anticipating the explosion go off before it actually did. He didn't emphasize the shock of the moment. He just emphasized the action. And I think he did that even worse in Mile 22 than he did in Patriot's Day. And even though Mile 22 is fictional, it's still muddled, and it gets my rating of a strikeout. As a matter of fact, the movie is called Mile 22, but I... Even watching this film, I forgot about the fact that there was some sort of subplot involving getting somebody 22 miles. Even that got lost, the title of the movie. So I can't recommend Mile 22, not by a mile. Hi, I found a toy dinosaur over on the playground by Smith Street. Uh, It had this phone number on it, and, well, I just wanted to make sure the dinosaur made it back to its little owner. When I found the little sippy cup, I just had to give you a call. It's for a kid, you know? I know my son gets super attached to the smallest things, even a fire truck, and I'd be happy to drop it off. We'd do anything for kids, yet one in six children in the U.S. struggle with hunger. Help end childhood hunger near you. Learn how at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Alpha. This is directed by Albert Hughes, which is one half of the Hughes brothers, who have directed such movies as Menace to Society, Dead Presidents, From Hell, and the underrated movie, The Book of Eli. And this time, Albert Hughes is going about it himself, not with his brother, Alan Hughes. And... I don't know what the story is behind that, what's what's going on with the two of them. Hopefully it's not a, uh, a falling out. But in any event, Alpha is a movie that takes place 20,000 years ago, in approximately 18,000 B.C. And in this prehistoric past, a young man who's played in this movie by Cody Smith-McPhee, who is an Australian actor, a young man struggles to return home after being separated from his tribe during a buffalo hunt and finds a similarly lost wolf companion to start a friendship that would change humanity. Or at least that's according to the description here. And the movie itself is... Okay, I think it's beautifully shot, actually. There are some mesmerizing panoramic um, shots in this film. The cinematography is quite amazing. And it was shot also in the Northwest Territory of Canada, where it's pretty desolate and also covered with snow. And this is probably the best place in North America to film such a movie. And I also liked about Alpha that the characters in the film didn't speak English, but instead spoke this archaic native tongue, which may or may not be based on a real language, but it doesn't really matter. I think 18,000 years ago, it's really hard to tell how people talked, spoke, I should say, even when um, there are cave drawings and written records of life back then. But in any event, the movie introduces us to this tribe, which is unnamed, but then again, it doesn't really have to be. And there is a young tribesman who I believe is the son of the the head of the tribe, who is still proving himself as a man. And his first test in proving himself as a hunter or a notable hunter for this tribe is to actually make a spearhead. When he passes that test, he actually goes out on the hunt with his father and several other tribesmen, and they go hunting for buffalo. And I'm... I'm reluctant to give what happens away, but long story short, Cody Smith McPhee's character, whose name is Kada, K-E-D-A, is 
left for dead. At first, his father is vehemently grieving the death of his son, and he's in a long state of denial. But eventually, he reluctantly accepts that his son is dead, or that his son is supposedly dead, and leaves him where he is. And eventually, Cody Smith-McPhee's character is brought, I, I, I shouldn't say brought back to life, but he's brought back to consciousness after being feared dead. And I won't exactly give away where he is, but the way he gets out of this situation of being left for dead is unrealistic. And that sets the movie off on somewhat of a bad note because you really have to suspend disbelief and leave your brain by the door for some of these parts. But the way he evades being left for dead should have been probably handled in a more realistic way. But in any event, he finds himself on dry land and finds himself being hunted by rabid wolves. He stabs one of the wolves and eventually the other wolves leave him alone, but then this wolf who he stabbed he nurses back to health and the two of them begin a quest to for him to find his way back to his tribe. And very much like the theme song of Gilligan's Island says, there, there's no phone, no light, no motor car, not a single luxury. And probably even more so than Robinson Crusoe, they, they are as primitive as can be. And certainly this is no exception. They, actually, the people on Gilligan's Island are probably even more advantaged. At least they had a radio that they made from coconuts. Again, that's a movie, that's a show where you have to spend suspend even more disbelief but alpha could probably be better compared to the revenant the movie starring leonardo dicaprio but it's hard to compare those two because even though i thought the revenant was more realistic it did take place in a different time whereas alpha takes place in 18,000 bc the Revenant took, takes place in the mid to late 1800s, where it's a little bit more familiar in terms of technology and also the way that somebody with limited resources survives. Also, I was told by people who listen to the show who live outside of the city that the part where Leonardo DiCaprio guts a horse and then sleeps inside it for warmth is very unrealistic. Well... Fair enough. But it seems like some of the other parts in this movie are realistic, particularly where Cody Smith McPhee's character is trying to get warmth, and he's in the middle of a snowstorm, and he finds warmth by cuddling up with a wolf. And you could argue that, of course, the wolf has body heat, and the two of them can get together like, and, like that, and create body warmth but then again it seems like you would need a lot more than a wolf and a and a fur coat to get through the harshness of the winter that you see in this film but nonetheless alpha is a movie that is a semi-typical boy and his dog or in this case boy of his wolf story but I did like certain elements of it. The, as I said before, the cinematography is amazing, especially the helicopter panoramic shots of this desolate, godforsaken land. Although, it's probably... It, actually, I would consider it godforsaken because there's a lot of snow, there's no vegetation, and it's amazing that the tribe survived as long as they had living in this land. But... I didn't think it was particularly realistic, or it should have been more realistic, particularly how Kata, Cody Smith McPhee's character, evades death. It just seemed a little implausible at times. But Alpha does get my rating of a checkout. If there's one thing you can say about either or both of the Hughes brothers, they do know how to tell a story, and sometimes they they miss the mark when it comes to realism, but... Alpha is unfortunately one of those cases, but I did enjoy it, and I certainly appreciate it. To buy it. your home, you became a house hunting ace, learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. 
To buy your home, you became a house hunting ace, learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which is directed by Desiree Akhavan, and this is her second feature film debut as a director after 2014's Appropriate Behavior, behavior spelled... B-E-H-I-V-I-O-U-R, so it was probably released in Great Britain or Australia, which is interesting because Desiree Akhavan is an American director. But The Miseducation of Cameron Post is based on a novel written by Emily M. Danforth. It takes place in 1993, and it tells the story of a teenage girl by the name of Cameron Post, who is played by Chloe Grace Moretz, and she is forced into gay conversion therapy by by her conservative guardians. This is after a mishap where she is attending prom her senior year, and she is actually caught by her boyfriend uh, making out with another girl. Now, I would imagine that no guys would have a problem with watching two girls making out, but in this movie, that is exactly what happens. I would let it slide. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. But in any event, she is sent to a conservative Christian gay conversion therapy center and back in 1993 it was not as acceptable to be homosexual whether you're a man or a woman as it is now i'm sure a lot of people consider it absolutely revolting but yeah in 1993 it was perfectly okay for somebody straight to be homophobic as a matter of fact even though the American Psychological Association took homosexuality off the list of mental disorders. There were still people in the 90s and the aughts who considered, who considered being homosexual to be a sin. As a matter of fact, there is a, there's a well-intentioned therapist in this film who makes the argument, you don't have parades and celebrations for drug addicts and of course that's not a good point but i guess in the in the, in the scheme of this film she this therapist is not the only person who who thinks this way and the therapist by the way i'm trying to find the the name uh, or the the name of the actress she's not like nurse ratchet where she runs the camp with a, a cold fist and has it regimentally scheduled. She is very charismatic and certainly has the facade of being a caring therapist, but her motives are questionable, particularly when there are other gay people in this this religious conversion center that are more questioning both their sexual urges and also the intentions of 
the people who are running this facility and also the the way they're running it. So Chloe Grace Moretz's character, Cameron, is somebody who is who, who at least was closeted when the film starts. I guess when she was caught, she had no choice but to come out. And she is, of course, reluctant to be sent to a place like this, especially when there's a reverend, uh, Rick, who's played by a young actor or a young-ish actor, a uh, guy in his early 30s by the name of John Gallagher Jr., who not only co-runs the the treatment facility, but also is a self-described former gay man. In other words, he used the therapy that's in this film to make him go straight. And of course, that is indeed questionable because is anybody really formerly gay or formerly straight? It's, it's weird. But in any event, his sister is the woman who runs the facility, whose name I now have. Her name in the movie is Dr. Lydia Marsh. And she's played by an actress named Jennifer L., who I've seen in a number of films over the last couple of years. Uh, she was in Zero Dark Thirty. She was in, she played Greg Kinnear's wife in Little Men. And she certainly is somebody who reminded me actually a little bit of Meryl Streep, actually, because she certainly had a charisma to her and a, a warmth, but also the motives just made you and by extension the main character of Cameron Post wonder what the motive behind this camp is is she convert is she trying in vain to convert gay people to be straight based on what she believes or based on what the people who are sponsoring the camp believes there are a lot of interesting questions that are being raised and i would like to think that 25 years after this movie takes place people are more accepting of homosexuals and probably not in any rush to convert them but my guess is especially with recent documentaries like jesus camp there are some disillusioned christians or i, I shouldn't lay the blame entirely on Christians, but there are disillusioned people who think that through religion and through discipline that people can be cured of what allegedly ails them. There are probably places like that. this on the Bible Belt, and the, the Convergent Center in this film is in western Pennsylvania, which is in the northeast where you wouldn't think they would even bother with conversion therapy. It's, it's almost like finding a conversion therapy center in California, for instance, especially around San Francisco. Not that I'm being stereotypical, but I'm just saying uh, San Francisco is one of the most liberal cities in the world. And, of course, New, um, the Northeast, not just New England, is also uh, quite liberal. But they do exist, probably, even in places you wouldn't normally expect. So the miseducation of Cameron Post is very well acted. Of course, me remembering 1993 really well. I actually had a fondness for some of the music here, but I also really loved Chloe Grace Moretz in this film. Again, even when she's in a movie that's not quite as good, like, for instance, Brain on Fire, which was a Netflix original that I reviewed, she... She is certainly making a lot of really brave choices in the role she plays, and I commend her for that. I also liked her her friend in this movie, uh, who's played by Sasha Lane from Hearts Beat Loud. And Miseducation of Cameron Post gets my rating of a knockout. It's definitely a film that's worth seeing, whether you're gay or straight. Hoy es el día en que tu hijo empieza a gatear. O leer sus primeras palabras. La Casa Roja. O cuando se dio cuenta que quieres ser ingeniera. 2X más Z. O es hoy, cuando tienes un choque en tu auto, tu hijo está en el car seat equivocado y todo podría cambiar. No arriesgues el futuro de tus hijos. Asegúrate de tener el car seat correcto para su edad y tamaño. Visita safercar.gov diagonal protegidos. Un mensaje de la Administración Nacional de Seguridad del Tráfico en las Carreteras y el Ad Council. I love those real six the ones that move me A thinly blow <laughs> Neurotic toe <laughs> Intensify and groove me 
All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Puzzle. This is the latest starring Kelly McDonald, and it also stars some other familiar faces like Irfan Khan and David Denman. The latter, David Denman, is probably known as the guy who usually gets dumped in films and TV shows. He's known for being originally Jenna Elfman's character's fiance in the first few seasons of The Office. And he also played a similar role where he got dumped by Jessica Lange's character in Tim Burton's movie Big Fish. And every time I see him in a movie and he's either uh, engaged or married, you kind of know he's going to get dumped just based on his the other characters he played. It's too bad because David Denman seems like a nice guy. But here in this movie, Kelly McDonald plays Agnes who is taken for granted as a suburban mother and housewife and discovers a passion for solving jigsaw puzzles. And it it starts when she is given a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle for her birthday and one afternoon when her husband, again, David Denman, and her two sons, one of whom works for her husband and the other who is in high school, are out of the house and she's just doing her chores, she sits down and she actually completes this thousand-piece puzzle in an unspecified amount of time but you can probably tell that she completed it very quickly and that's not easy to do with a thousand piece puzzle for me i love doing puzzles especially ones that are about a th- you know 500 to a thousand pieces but it usually takes me weeks to complete one but here she completed it in a matter of hours it would have been nice to have known when she was completing the puzzle, how long it actually took her. And I wish the movie would have elaborated upon that, but it didn't. But in any event, she eventually discovers where she, uh, where the person who gave her the puzzle got the puzzle. And it turned out to be this obscure coffee shop and puzzle store in New York City. And while she's there, she actually answers an ad for someone who is looking for a partner to help not only complete puzzles, but also compete in a tournament for two people where they complete a puzzle in a matter of hours. And this partner is an Indian immigrant whose name is, if you'll excuse me for a moment, Robert, and he's played by Irfan Khan. And Irfan Khan is one of those actors who you don't know from me saying his name but he's been in a number of films that might be familiar to western scratch that he's been in a number of films that are familiar to western audiences for instance he played the police inspector in slumdog millionaire and he also played a scientist by the name of masrani in the first jurassic world movie which is much better than jurassic world fallen kingdom he's been in a number of other films as well in fact on imdb he has 145 credits to his name which means that he's probably going to be in a number of other american and indian productions but he he is very good in this film and this is certainly probably a breakout role for him as much as it is for kelly mcdonald and i should also mention other films which you've probably seen Kelly McDonald in. She is a Scottish actress, but she's American in this one. Um, she was in both train spotting movies as Diane. She was, she played Josh Brolin's wife in No Country for Old Men. Uh, where she played a, act, um, a woman by the name of Carol Jean Moss. And she also played the Princess Merida in Pixar's Brave, which was their second film that centered on human characters as the main characters, not just toys or monsters or cars even. And yeah, Kelly McDonald did a really good job playing a a woman who was 17 years old, even though at the time she was filming the movie, she was actually 35. But in any event, Puzzle is a movie that you kind of think that you know where the movie's going, but it ends up actually becoming less of a sports story you know, in in terms of the competition part of it, and becomes more of a study of people who are taken for granted in their life and maybe have not as solid 
a foundation in their home life as they might think. And David Denman plays Kelly McDonald's husband, who seems to be appreciative of her. But there are certain signs that maybe that appreciation and maybe even the love has worn off. In the meantime, there is a notable attraction between Kelly McDonald's character and Irfan Khan's character. Uh, let me say that again. There's a notable attraction that goes on between Agnes and Robert. As a matter of fact, a Kelly McDonald's character is named Agnes, which is one of those films, which is one of those names, excuse me, that's very much like Bertha or Edna or Ethel. It's one of those names that you don't associate with modern women, especially since Kelly McDonald, as of the date of this show, is 42 years old. You would think that Agnes is a name that probably ran out of style in the 50s or what have you. And there, there is a story behind that. As a matter of fact, it seems that Kelly McDonald's character is probably stuck in a certain time period, not out of nostalgia, but maybe out of necessity. After all, she does play a housewife in this movie in a in a lower middle class family where her husband is a mechanic. And they do run into money pr troubles here, but it doesn't seem to occur to either of them for Agnes to get a job, which is quite interesting, but doesn't ruin the movie at all, mind you. As a matter of fact, th this movie is actually a remake of a film that was made in Argentina in 2010, which was also called called Puzzle. It came out in, uh, th this American version came out in 2018, and th there are a lot of layers that make this story unique. It did remind me in terms of directing style of Tom uh, McCarthy, especially films he did like The Visitor, but it's actually directed by Mark Turtletob, who is a... Um, a 72-year-old director who also produced Little Miss Sunshine and Loving, amongst other critically acclaimed films. As far as being a director goes, his only full-length film to which he's directed is God's Behaving Badly, which I haven't seen. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Wildfire smoke's greatest health threat is to those with heart and lung conditions, older adults, and children. Listen for advice from local authorities and limit your exposure to any smoke, including low levels. Keep your indoor air as clean as possible. If you have asthma or other lung conditions, follow your respiratory management plan. See a doctor if you have a hard time breathing or if your normal symptoms worsen. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I was talking so much about the movie Puzzle that I ran out of time to actually rate it. So, here it is. It gets my reading of a knockout. It's very well acted. I loved Kelly McDonald and... and her co-star, Irfan Khan, and I thought the movie just worked well on, on so many levels, especially being a puzzle geek like I am. So, now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for this show, the next segment is What's Coming Out Next. This is a spoken word segment of the movies that are coming to, to a theater near you this coming weekend, unless... I say otherwise. The big movie that's coming out this coming weekend is one called The Happy Time Murders. And this is a movie about a puppet cast of an 80s children's TV show who begin to get murdered one by one, and a disgraced L.A. detective turned private eye puppet takes on the case. This movie stars Melissa McCarthy, where she, this is a buddy cop movie where she's teamed up with a Muppet. A literal Muppet. And interestingly enough, you would think this is a movie like Meet the Feebles where it's making fun of the Muppets. And it might be, but it's actually directed by Brian Henson, 
who is Jim Henson's son and also a Muppeteer in his own right, and probably more so than by nepotism. But this is going to be really interesting, because it also co-stars Elizabeth Banks and Maya Rudolph, and th- this seems to be a movie which Judd Apatow had some involvement in, but I can't exactly say for sure. But it seems like one that Judd Apatow would jump at the chance to to produce at least or maybe even write but brian henson has actually been up to a a lot with well with the muppets and also with other um film and tv projects uh amongst the films he directed previously include probably not surprisingly the muppet christmas carol which i consider the second best muppet movie the second only to the muppet movie from 1979 he also directed muppet treasure island which i didn't think was quite as good as far as other films he's directed he hasn't actually directed any other mainstream films He's directed a TV movie called Tinseltown from 2007, and the other movies he's directed have been Jim. Hent- uh, the other TV series he's directed have been Muppet Projects, not surprisingly. But The Happy Time Murders is a movie I will definitely check out. It is rated R, so it's not for kids, but I bet kids will want to sneak into this film in any event. But it is a movie I will definitely see, and I will review it for you for next week. Another film that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is one called AX. L. I'm not sure if it's pronounced AXL or Axel, but in any event, that's the way the movie is spelled. AXL. And AXL is a top secret robotic dog who develops a special friendship with Miles and will go to any length to protect his new companion. So this sounds basically like Alpha with a mechanical dog. It stars Thomas Jane, Becky G, Alex Newstater, and Ted McGinley. So I'm not familiar with many of those names. I am familiar with Thomas Jane and Ted McGinley. Becky G seems too cool for a full last name, but she is actually a (laughs) very pretty young actress who has been in movies like Power Rangers from last year, which was an underrated film, Neighbors 2, Sorority Rising, and also she was on the soundtrack for Hotel Transylvania. But in any event, Axel is a movie, I'm not sure if I'm going to like it, but I'm definitely going to check it out and I will review it for you for next week's show. Another film that is guaranteed to be in theaters near you is one called Searching. This is a drama mystery theater about a desperate father who, after his 16-year-old daughter goes missing, breaks into her laptop to look for clues to find her. This movie stars John Cho of Harold and Kumar fame. It also co-stars Deborah Messing of Will and Grace, Joseph Lee, and Michelle La. Uh, This movie looks interesting. It certainly has an interesting premise, and I think John Cho is a very good actor. So I'd be interested to see how this movie comes out. And it's coming out in theaters near you, probably me, since I live in Boston. And that's a movie I will see for you, and I will review it for you for next week's show. The other films that are coming out are coming out in limited release. There's one actually called Support the Girls, which stars Regina Hall. And it's about the general manager at a highway side sports bar with curves which is kind of like Hooters, who has her incurable optimism and faith in her girls, her customers, and herself tested over the course of a long, strange day. That sounds like a great premise, and I do really like Regina Hall, and I especially liked her in the film Girls Trip from last year. Of course, she wasn't as big a breakout star in that movie as Tiffany Haddish was, but the fact that we're still talking about that movie tells you how how good it was. But Support the Girls is a movie I hope comes out in the theater near me. If it does, I'll review it for you, and I'll let you know what I think on next week's show. But that just about wraps things up with this week's Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And, of course, I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, having a great time talking to you guys about movies. Until next week's show, this is Dan Burke saying, as always, I'll see you at the movies.